Welcome everyone to lecture number 11 on some significant changes taking place in the Western Hemisphere during the 19th and early 20th centuries. We'll begin with a discussion of what is often termed of as Latin America today. Now Spain had dominated much of Central and South America for almost 300 years by the time we get to the 19th century. And in addition to leaving deep cultural imprints into the region after such a long period of domination and, and deep linguistic imprints into this region, we will see that the Roman Catholic Church will grow enormously in stature under Spanish colonial domination of these regions. From the standpoint of the Spanish, as well as many other Europeans, they firmly believe that their domination of other areas of the world was supported by their faith of Christianity. And in Latin America, this was no different. The Roman Catholic Church took vigorous efforts to try to convert Native Americans to Christianity. And they practiced a number of, uh, we would say today, uh, rather brutal actions to try to suppress Native American belief systems. For example, in 1535, the Bishop of Mexico proudly claimed that he had destroyed 500 pagan shrines and 20,000 idols. We will see that Native Americans that will refuse to embrace Catholicism will be tortured. Some of them will be uh, simply burned at the stake as heretics. This ruthless policy and repressive religious atmosphere will ultimately mean that the influence of the Roman Catholic Church will spread far and wide through Central and South America. Moving now to the social effects of Spanish domination for such a long period of time, the Spanish in the Americas set up a, a fairly rigid racial hierarchy, a caste system, a class system that had everything to do with your lineage. Those of supposedly pure Spanish ancestry were accorded the highest levels of authority in the Spanish colonies. Those that were considered mestizos of mixed Native American and Spanish ancestry fell further down on this socioeconomic hierarchy. And then with the introduction of African slavery to the Americas, those that were of mixed African, Native, or Spanish ancestry blended together fell on the lowest parts of this hierarchy. Broadly speaking, the darker your color of the, the darker the color of your skin, the less power you had in these Spanish colonial societies. There was even snobbery among those of pure Spanish ancestry. Distinctions were observed between those who were born in Europe, that were born back home in Spain, uh, known as peninsulares, and those that were born in the New World, those that were known as Creoles. To put it simply, Creoles were just not given the same respect as those that were born back home in Spain, the peninsulares. And as you might imagine, such a rigid and you know, exploitative class system is not going to sit well, uh, not only among this particular elite group, but among the masses of people who often find themselves with no political voice and no hope of bettering this, their situation economically. In all, what we see is by the early 19th century is a, a number of tensions had built up throughout Spain's colonial holdings to the point where they're going to boil over into a rather rapid series of independence movements. This rigid class system that we just got done talking about, that's a, an ongoing irritant. We'll also see that Spain's mercantilist policy in their colonies, their desire to strictly control all imports and exports is going to rub people the wrong way. We'll also see that the influence of the Enlightenment, these ideals of liberty and equality, the influence of other revolutions, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, that as this knowledge begins to circulate throughout many of these Spanish colonies, they say, well, if the Americans can break away from a cruel, tyrannical foreign power, right, if, uh, you know, the French can do away with their monarchy, why can we not throw off Spanish control and liberate ourselves? 
Several internal problems will also begin bubbling up in Spain under King Charles III. After he died, his son Charles IV was weak and indecisive. Um, he basically was not someone that was a very commanding presence back at home. Then you add on top of that Napoleon Bonaparte, who we talked about in a prior lecture. He invades Spain in 1808 and adds that to part of his growing empire. For the colonists, therefore, the Spanish colonists here in the New World, this is a perfect time to strike. In other words, while the home country is already busy and divided and, and taking care of other things, they, they're at their weakest. So now would be a good time for us to rise up in rebellion. And truly, the independence of Latin America from Spain was kind of a foregone conclusion by this point. As soon as the Creoles, those people born here in, uh, in Latin America, began thinking of themselves as Americans rather than as Spaniards, then that sets up a difference, right? It sets up a kind of an us versus them mentality. And with this in mind, it's no coincidence that it will be Creole leaders like Simon Bolivar and José San Martín that will energize and steer many of these new rebellions. Bolivar was born in Caracas in 1783 to a Creole family, and he was trained early on in military service. He traveled extensively for several years back to Europe, where he heard a lot about um, equality, liberty, you know, some of these ideals that had recently come to light as a result of the American and French revolutions. And when he sailed back to the New World in 1807, he joined in the brewing civil war, the budding independence movement in South America. He understood, though, that in order to mobilize a, a successful insurrection against the Spanish, that he needed as many people in the military as possible. And while Bolivar's family from the aristocracy had slaves, he will be among the first to set them free. He will later call for the abolition of slavery across the entire Western Hemisphere. And as you might expect, those that have now been freed from bondage were very willing soldiers, ready to join up and enlist in the cause of freedom from Spain. What we will see is a back and forth for many years that for Bolivar and his forces, while they were deeply motivated for their independence, Spanish forces were well trained and there were many of them that could be deployed to the New World. Gradually though, by 1818, uh, we begin to see that his forces are building to the point where they're starting to wear down the Spanish. They have the home field advantage of fighting on their soil, whereas these new Spanish soldiers that have been sent over to subdue the rebellion don't have that specialized knowledge. Gradually, by 1825, much of Latin America had achieved its independence. You can see the stark difference in the areas of Spanish control by 1800, but then by 1830, you have all these new independent countries that have come into existence. The people of Upper Peru decided to form a separate nation and name it in honor of Bolivar. So the country of Bolivia is named after him. He will write its constitution and accept the position of a lifetime president. José San Martín will also be an instrumental figure in helping Latin America achieve its independence from Spanish domination. He was an Argentinian general, governor, and patriot who led his nation during the wars of independence. He also provided crucial military aid to Bolivar in helping to liberate Peru from the Spanish. And there are several key effects of these Latin American independence movements. Of course, as these new nations are formed, they're going to have to consider the question, what type of government should we have? And here is where the legacy of class discrimination and socioeconomic inequality really are brought to bear because the, this argument over what type of government should be established is going to be strongly influenced by ongoing tensions between the ruling leadership and the non-landholding population. I'll give you an example. In Argentina, for instance, after independence, the newly formed Congress could not agree on what type of government was best, and the result was a nation that was in, will end up being convulsed with long periods of intense domestic struggles from 1819 to 1852. In Chile, uh, the newly drafted constitution was similar to that of the United States, emphasizing the rights of the citizenry, 
But in truth, it was a landholding elite class that tended to dominate the political scene at the expense of the majority of the landless population of poor. Other Latin American nations got off to a similarly rocky start after their independence from Spain. An example of this would be Mexico. Uh, they underwent their revolution in 1810. It ended in 1821, but they too considered what was the best form of government. In Mexico, the ruling classes wanted to establish a strong central government with the backing of the army and the Roman Catholic Church. The poorer classes, however, had a different vision. They wanted a more liberal representative government that largely let the states run themselves. There were also ongoing problems with racial discrimination against native groups in Mexico and the issue of land ownership, which is to say you have very few large landowners that, that own the majority of the territory in Mexico, and then you have virtually no small farmers. Uh, the rest of the population is sort of landless and uh, kept in a position of political and economic subjugation. Almost a hundred years after Spanish liberation, these chronic problems were still lingering in Mexico. Tired of virtual dictatorships by the landholding elite, we will see a revolution emerge in 1910. Emiliano Zapata was a key motivating figure to the native population, to the poor, those people who were just tired of living a second class life. Growing up in a rural area, he witnessed firsthand the many con ongoing conflicts between villagers and landowners over the continual theft of village land by wealthy interests. When the revolution broke out in Mexico in 1910, Zapata continued his fight for land and liberty, rebelling against anyone who interfered with his plan of Ayala, which called for the seizure of all foreign-owned land. Basically, his plan of Ayala called for land redistribution on a large scale. He wanted the state to confiscate land held by some of these largest families and uh, he called on the existing president Madero to step down and he wanted free elections to take place. Unfortunately for the poor, in April of 1919, Zapata was tricked into meeting with one of then President Carranza's generals, and the meeting was a trap. Zapata was killed as he arrived there, and we'll see that during this bloody decade between 1910 and 1920, Mexico will lose some one million lives over these issues of systemic racism, issues of uh, land exploitation, land theft, and issues of economic and political inequality. Fortunately, there is a silver lining. A new constitution will be drafted in Mexico in 1917, enacting a number of significant and sweeping changes, such as universal male suffrage, a minimum wage, an eight-hour workday, and land redistribution, at least on a limited scale. Now, it should be noted at this point that the United States, during the 19th century, will welcome many of these newly independent countries in Latin America. But at the same time, they will also be looking for business opportunities, shall we say, in the region. And many American businessmen will not only own lots of land in some of these newly minted nations, they will be involved in operating mines, uh, to mine for precious metals. They will be involved in agricultural, setting up agricultural plantations for bananas, for example, for pineapples and other types of produce. In the Caribbean, for instance, uh, they'll be involved in setting up sugarcane plantations. In other words, my bigger point that I'm mo moving towards here is the United States has a keen interest in Latin America and will intervene often, as we're going to see, in the region in order to protect its businesses and to maintain its political and military control of the Western Hemisphere. And all of this begins under President James Monroe, who lays out the Monroe Doctrine, which is based upon the principle of non-interference. He's going to declare in 1823 that European nations should not come sniffing around the Americas. They should not come look at these newly uh, independent countries, look at them as potential uh, targets for them to take over. That they should stay out of the Western Hemisphere and the United States would not interfere with European affairs. The U.S. will also face its own challenges as the Civil War breaks out. 
many of you have taken U.S. history classes, so uh, I apologize if I'm giving this uh, a lack of attention here, but uh, basically we were going to see that the country will convulse over the issue of slavery and through the 13th Amendment passed in 1865, we will see slavery finally abolished in North America and the nation will have to slowly knit itself back together during a turbulent period known as Reconstruction.